Our next presenter is Laura Higgins. Ms. Higgins serves as the section manager for drinking water standards section within the water supply division at TCEQ. Her team ensures that public water systems protect public health and comply with the lead and copper rule by minimizing lead and copper levels in drinking water, primarily by reducing corrosion of plumbing material. Prior to joining the water supply division, Laura performed assessments of drinking water laboratories as part of the laboratory accreditation group within the Office of Compliance and Enforcement at TCEQ. She, serves as a sen she served as the senior microbiologist biologist for that group and has previously worked as a bench microbiologist for both private and state laboratories. Laura received her Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from Texas A&M University and has helped author two papers on various microbiology topics. She has enjoyed over a decade-long career as a public servant and is passionate about protecting public health. Please join me in welcoming Laura Higgins. All right, um, as Theresa said, I attended Texas A&M University. I don't know if we have any Aggies in the room today. There we go. I'd like to start with a, a howdy. howdy. There we go. Thank you, guys. OK, so good morning, everyone. Um, as Theresa said, my name is Laura Higgins. Uh, and until August, I, I'm now the former team leader for the lead and copper monitoring team. I'm now the section manager for the drinking water standards section. Um, but what I wanted to do today in today's presentation is to lay some of the groundwork uh, for the lead and copper rule revisions and discuss some of the first steps that water systems can take to prepare for the lead service line inventory. Okay, so last year at PDW, um, we spent some time going over some of the main elements of the LCRR. So this year, um, what I'd like to do is do a brief recap of the LCRR and then discuss the service line inventory form 20943 and spend some time just walking through its requirements. And then finally, I wanna spend some time discussing what you need to be focusing on and preparing for right now in order to ensure compliance with the LCRR come uh, 2024. So EPA's promulgation of the LCRR is intended to meet the goals of proactively removing lead service lines from the distribution system. Also empowering communities through advanced public notification and more equitably protecting public health for disadvantaged populations and children. With the publication of the LCRR, the EPA announced the forthcoming lead and copper rule improvements, so the LCRI, which is supposed to expand elements of the LCRR, such as sampling, replacement plans, lead testing in schools, and public notification. So we're gonna go through the LCRR today, but keep that in mind, we still have the LCRI to get to, so stay tuned. Next year's PDW is also gonna be great. <laughs> All right, so outlined here is just a quick snapshot of the LCR and LCRR timelines. So the lead and copper rule uh, was originally published in 1991 with the rule language that we currently operate under today. The LCRR was published with an effective date of December 16th of 2021 and a compliance due date of October 16th, 2024. I said that a lot in our presentation last year, that October 16th, 2024 date. If you don't have that circled on your calendars right now, do so. I'm gonna say it a lot. There might be a pop quiz later. And then the lead and copper rule improvements, those are currently in development and are expected to be published before that LCRR compliance date of October 16th of 2024. See, I almost caught you guys. So the LCRR contains some fairly significant changes from the lead and copper rule that we currently operate under today. So some of the biggest changes are listed here. Um, it's a lot to digest, uh, and I just, so I just want to focus today on developing that lead service line inventory, because developing that initial inventory is the one element of the LCRR that EPA has told us will not change with the publication of the LCRI. So that's why it's really important, that's what we want to focus on right now, because everything else on this list could change. 
Okay, so before we dive in, um, let's just go over some definitions real quick. Just some, some things that I think we all need to be familiar with. So, definition of a lead service line. That means a portion of pipe that is made of lead, which connects the water main to the building inlet. And a lead service line may be owned by the water system, owned by the property owner, or both. And then also a galvanized, galvanized requiring replacement is a term that we see in LCRR, and that means a galvanized service line that is or was at any time downstream of a lead service line or could be currently downstream of a lead status unknown service line. Gooseneck, pigtail, or connector is a short section of piping, typically not exceeding two feet, uh, which can be bent, used for connections between rigid service piping, and for the purposes of this rule, uh, lead goosenecks, pigtails, and connectors are not considered part of that definition of a lead service line, but they could be required to be replaced uh, pursuant to 141.84c. And then the last definition here is lead status unknown, which means a service line that has not been demonstrated to meet the Safe Drinking Water Act definition of lead free. Uh, so in talking to systems, we've heard a bunch of folks who were under the impression that if they had uh, unknown service lines, uh, that, they were, that they were gonna have to report those as lead. And I wanna just take the time right now to say that that's not the case. So reporting service lines as lead status unknown does require some extra steps, just uh, providing a public notice to customers. But that's really just because when you have an unknown, you can't say for sure that it's lead free, right? So I just wanna make that clear that yes, there's some extra steps, but unknown is its own category within the inventory. So if you have an unknown, you're not putting lead in the inventory, you're just putting unknown because we can't say that it's lead free. Okay. All right, so this is a graphic that TCQ developed and just showing some of the key features of a drinking water service line. And for all of our non-transient, non-community systems in the room, this is more similar to what a community water system looks like. Um, and I just wanted to take the time to show this just to point out, again, we talked about that the inventory needs to include uh, if, if the property of the service line is split, that service line inventory is gonna include both the water system side and the customer side. So where ownership is split, you're including both of those in the inventory. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to discussing the service line inventory. So this citation that's on the screen, 40 CFR 141.84, outlines the requirements for lead service line inventories and material classifications. So inventories must include all service lines connected to the distribution system, regardless of ownership. We just saw that last graphic. And all the service lines need to be categorized into one of four categories. So we have lead, galvanized requiring replacement, lead status unknown, and non-lead. All right, so who needs to submit a service line inventory? And the answer to that is simply all systems who are currently subject to the lead and copper rule are going to be regulated under the lead and copper rule revisions. And those are who are required to submit form 20943 to the, to the TCQ by October 16th of 2024. So that's all community and all non-transient, non-community water systems. So if you don't know what kind of system you are, you can come talk to me afterwards, but that's who needs to submit an inventory to TCQ. Okay, so this is the most important slide here in the, whole, in the whole presentation. And this is mainly just to say that October 16th of 2024 is gonna be here before you know it. And time is a ticking. So if you haven't started on your service line inventory, please, please don't wait. Please, pretty please, please, please start. Please start your inventory today. I beg you, this is me begging you, okay. Okay, so this, this slide outlines what is included in that service line inventory form 20943. So each of the bullets here represents a different worksheet that's in the Excel workbook um, in total. So the bullets on the left represent uh, reference sheets and things that are used for background information. 
and all of the bullets on the right hand side are different worksheets that have fields that water systems are uh, going to need to fill out. Okay, in this slide, I just want to point out the sheets highlighted in yellow um, in that red box down at the bottom of the screen. So these are the sheets that are used for reference. They don't include any, any fields that need to be filled out, um, but just we have the introduction sheet um, just used for reference. Um, organization, it just describes each of the following worksheets to come. We have the template instruction sheet, which houses directions for each of the required fields um, in those worksheets that are highlighted in blue. We'll get to those in a second. And then the classifying SLs worksheet um, is used as a guidance on how to, how you should classify the entire service line if ownership is split. It kind of breaks down different scenarios for you. So these three background sheets um, should be reviewed and understood by the system. Um, they've got some great information in there. Um, but of course, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the Lead and Copper team. We're always happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, so then on this slide, I wanna show the, the blue boxes down at the bottom of the screen that are, again, highlighted in that red box. So these are the sheets that have required information for the public water system to fill out. So we begin with the PWS information sheet. Uh, that's gonna house all your basic information, um, phone number, contact, public water system ID number, et cetera. And there's also a spot for a PWS representative. The information that's entered into this worksheet is gonna duplicate in other places throughout the Excel workbook. So if you fill this out once, hopefully we saved you some time so you don't have to fill it out 10 more times after that. Uh, the next sheet is the inventory methods worksheet. So the LCRR requires method review. And part one of this worksheet allows systems to document that review. So the LCRR outlines five different types of records that must be reviewed. And so the table here um, just gives you a place to indicate whether or not that, that record was reviewed and then provide some detail on what was reviewed. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time. So the, the LCRR requires record review. So the takeaway from this slide is just to urge folks to get a little creative with their records. We hear a lot of systems tell us that they don't have records. But I really wanna know, you know, I really urge folks to really exhaust everything at your disposal. So to think about, um, maybe things beyond what, what you might have in your, in your office or in your filing cabinets, but um, tax codes. Um, you can get an affidavit or an interview with senior personnel who might just know in their brain what's in the ground. Um, all of these things, you can, if you write that down, that's now a record and counts towards your record review. So all of this is things that you can use at your disposal, um, and we really want people to, to really take full advantage. Of course, the other th main thing is our Texas lead ban is July 1st of 1988. So in combination with construction dates, you can use that to say that maybe a, a service line is likely non-lead. So on that inventory methods worksheet, there are two other sections, uh, two other tables, part two and part three. Um, I just wanna go back for a second. So we noticed the coloring on this table was kind of an aqua color and that's to designate that this is a required field. And if we look at these other two tables, they're like a light blue color. All of our required fields are an aqua color, and the field also has a little superscript X. I think X marks the spot. X is a required field that has to be filled out. But we notice that these two other tables are light blue. They don't have that superscript X. They don't have that required coloring. So these tables are optional. Um, there's, there's reasons why you would want to fill these out, potentially. Um, but, uh, you know, mainly you want to use this to just denote normal operations. Um, you can use it to track any investigations that you're doing while you're preparing your inventory. But just want to go back to the thing that is required, which is a record review. So we've heard some people thinking that I have to go dig up all the lines. No, you don't. Record review is what's required. So we got a lot of, of feedback thinking that TC crew is requiring me to excavate. These are optional fields. In the course of your normal operations, you can use this to document. But what's required for the inventory 
is record review. Okay. Okay, so the inventory sheet, uh, inventory summary sheet, excuse me, is broken up into two parts. So part one, which is shown here, includes just general information on service line ownership, um, and, and if there's any local lead service line regulation, you can enter all that there. Um, there are two required fields. If you notice, we just talked about what's, what a required field looks like, so you see that aqua coloring right here. So there's two required fields, and that's for designating, is this an initial inventory or an updated inventory? And the second question is just asking who owns the service line? Is the ownership split? Does the water system own the entirety of the service lines? Um, et cetera. So if you are, say, a non-transient, non-community system, and you own the entire length of those service lines, then any, if you select that in that field, then anything that is relating to a customer portion, um, when we get to that later on in the inventory, that'll all be grayed out for you so you don't even have to worry about, do I need to fill in something here? So we tried to fill in a lot of features into this template that as you fill it out, it'll it'll give back to you what you put into it, if that makes sense. So as you, as you give it more information about the kind of water system you are, it'll, it'll reorganize itself. So take away anything that you don't need to fill out, um, auto-populate things, calculate things for you. So we try to make it as, as convenient as we possibly could. So part two of this worksheet is um, the table that will be auto-populated based off of information that's entered in our detailed inventory worksheet. So before you submit the inventory, you just wanna come back to this table and make sure that all the information here is accurate. But in theory, because there's formulas built in, you shouldn't actually have to fill anything into this table at all. It should auto-populate for you. So hopefully another nice feature that systems can enjoy, but just wanted to know, wanted you to know that, yeah, come back and check this, make sure it's accurate but you don't actually have to fill anything in here. Okay, so now we get to the detailed inventory worksheet. And this is really the bread and butter of Form 20943. So this slide um, is a little overwhelming, maybe not a little, a lot, um, but I, I don't want folks to panic. So remember what I just told you about the required fields. So fields that are colored aqua and have a superscript X, that is what is required to be filled out on this form. Anything with the light blue coloring is optional. It could be conditionally optional based on some of the formulas that we have built in. But if we take a look at that, just keeping that information in mind, if we just break that down of what is required on this form, it gets a lot more manageable. You suddenly have, instead of so many fields that we can't even read what's on here, right? But if we just break it down to just seeing where those required fields are, we're looking at location information, a PWS side of service material classification, customer side classification, and then an overall material classification. And also, guess what? That overall material classification will auto-populate for you. So you don't actually have to enter anything given that all the other information is there. It should auto-populate for you. So if we take that, all that in mind, this gets a lot more reasonable. No way, so I'm hearing no way, but I, I, we're trying, we're trying, okay? All right, so let's, let's take a little, little closer look. So the first section is just that location identification information. So the LCRR requires that you put a location identifier for each of your service lines. So, um, TCQ, at TCQ, we thought that for most folks, it would be easiest just to put uh, your a postal address, a street address, so we have it broken down into street number, street name, city, and zip code. For maybe some of our rural, rural folks, or um, if, a, if a street address doesn't really apply to you, we do have options to put a GPS coordinates, latitude and longitude, and we also included another column for other location identifier, say you have um, maybe an apartment complex where you have multiple service lines that share the same address, you can use that other location identifier column to just denote, um, you know, building A, building B, or any other information that, that might go a little above and beyond to designate what those service lines are. So what's required is just a location identifier, so you don't have to fill out all of them, you need, just need to give us 
something here. So you can do just the GPS coordinates, just a street address, but as long as we have a location identifier in, in one, some of these fields, that is what's required. Okay. So the next section is that detailed, um, or is the, uh, the system owned portion and that customer owned portion. So um, I kind of showed you before that if we said we are say a non-transient, non-community system, I own all of the service lines in the system, then all of that customer owned portion, that gets grayed out automatically. So you don't have to fill out anything in those columns. You just have to focus on that system owned portion. If you're a community system, sorry, it'll be the opposite. You will have to fill out that customer owned portion information if the ownership is split. Um, but just breaking down what, what those columns are. And then again, that last entire, uh, entire service line material classification should auto-populate based on the, the fields before it. Uh, the next grouping of information is other potential sources of lead. So knowing that we have the LCRI on the horizon, knowing that some elements of the rule are gonna change again, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know if y'all do, but we don't know what the future is going to hold. So we added some extra columns. Again, these are optional. But we thought it might be nice if you have to do this work the first time, then hopefully we, we save you some work later on if, if it's asked of you. So these columns ask for, you know, if you, in the course of your normal operations, if you know that there's a lead connector, um, if you know that there is lead solder on the service line, um, if you know that there are other types of fittings or any other sources of lead, this is an, a great place to document that if you know it. And then we have columns um, geared towards the new tiering criteria. So all of these columns are focused on that new tiering structure. So if you fill these out, you'll auto get, automatically get populated with uh, the new sample site selection criteria. That's that, that final column that's currently blank on the screen. But if, you, if we were to fill this out in real life, you would automatically get populated that new uh, sample site criteria. And then finally, we have the um, lead service line replacement. So as you're going, some folks we've heard are really eager to start replacing lead service lines if they find them. Um, and we just wanted to give folks a place to do that. So we have a date um, that your system owned lead service line replacement, customer owned lead service line replacement, just a place to document that if you want to start getting ahead on that right now. Okay, the next thing is the public accessibility worksheet. So the public accessibility that's shown here, um, this is intends to make the, how you intend to make the service line publicly accessible to your customers. Um, again, notice that all of these fields are required. Um, so if you don't fill out the required fields, then your inventory may not be accepted, just, just so you know. Well, the next slide I was gonna talk about was um, just taking a moment to talk about some of the increased communication requirements of the LCRR. So uh, I know for maybe for a lot of you or, or for what I've heard from systems, if you don't like talking to TCQ, a lot of folks don't like dealing with their customers even more, especially if they're angry. Um, but you know, part of the LCRR is a lot of trying to be more proactive, trying to, have more transparency with their customers. So the public accessibility um, requirement for the inventory, that's just one aspect of this. So some of the other requirements, um, if I have to talk off my head, off the top of my head now. So some of the other requirements are gonna be um, providing notice to customers within 24 hours of a action level exceedance. Um, notice to customers if their individual uh, home or sample site exceeds the action level, they have to be notified within three days. Um, there's a requirement, of course, for providing notice if uh, there are service lines in your inventory that have lead, uh, unknown, or galvanized requiring replacement. Anyone served by that connection will need a notice. Um, and then there's other increased notices for the schools. Um, and so forth, but just wanted to put that on the radar about, you know, of course we're all still gonna wait until we get to the lead service, or the lead and copper rule improvements, um, but increased notices is one part of EPA saying, I'm gonna get two questions at the end if you're, oh, you'll be first, okay. Okay, and then, okay. <laughs> yes, all of, all of that will be part of find and fix or things. Oh, yes, so asking about follow-up samples, um, 
that's also, there's also that portion of the LCRR as well. Um, again, not gonna focus on that too much today until we get to LCR. Next year's PDW is gonna be a doozy, so stay tuned for that. But the last portion of that inventory sheet is just the certification worksheet. Um, and that's just gonna be where your PWS representative um, is going to certify that they um, understand and know to the best of their ability that the inventory has been filled out, you know, is true and correct. Um, and again, those are all required fields, so the inventory will not be accepted by TCQ unless those are filled out. Okay. All right, so then after that, you would have seen a slide talking about some next steps. Um, so public water systems need to continue to comply with um, the previous lead and copper rule until that LCRR compliance date of Perfect, October 16th of 2024, excellent. Um, again, we're all gonna stay tuned to see what the LCRI brings us. Um, uh, we're hearing different dates, I think maybe now October, November is when we've been told we might see the first glimpses of the LCRI, um, but, but stay tuned. So certainly Aug August of next year will be full of information, okay. Um, I also had a timeline just to share, so we've had a lot of dates, I, you know, you, you all were beautiful to, to tell me October 16th, 2024, but there's been a lot of dates that we've thrown around. Um, so I had a timeline to kind of show when the LCRR was published, when we think the LCRI might be published, all the things that have happened in between, um, but that'll be in the slides, uh, the slide deck for your reference later. I, I also just like to take the time, I'm, the last portion of my presentation here is just gonna be on some additional resources, but, um, and, and talking about things that folks can be working on right now. Um, one of the biggest things I tell folks too is just, you know, knowledge is power. So if you haven't read the LCRR, I encourage you to do so. Um, there's also three different guidance documents from EPA that have been published. Um, guidance on developing and maintaining your service line inventory a guidance for small entities, so thinking small systems and NTNCs, and then also um, an eight-page fact sheet. I know, you know, reading the rule itself is not fun. It's, you know, not, it's not the most riveting thing you've ever read in your life. Um, and nor is that first guidance document, I think it's, it's well over 100 pages, so not quite a light read. But some of the more recent uh, uh, guidance documents that they've published especially the fact sheet, it's only eight pages. It's got some beautiful graphics in it. And again, knowledge is power, so I really encourage everyone to take the time to read it um, because there's really some great information in there. The second thing I urge people to do, and you heard, me, you heard me beg, beg you earlier, is to start working on that lead service line inventory. Because October's gonna be here before we know it, and you know this is no small task. So the sooner you start working on it, the sooner you um, have an idea of what, you know, what your service lines are made of, the sooner you can start applying for funding. Here's some of those other increased no types of notices that are covered in the LCRR. This isn't everything, this is just a few things. Um, but just to demonstrate that increased communication is a priority, it's one of the main goals of the LCRR. So as we're talking about making the inventory publicly accessible, know that there's even more types of notice to come. So before we get into too much of the, the actual details of what those notices are gonna be like, um, just, just have it in the top of your brain know, knowing that those are gonna come. Here's that certification page. Uh, talked about next steps. Here's that timeline. And then again, what to be working on right now. Working on your inventory. You're reading all the guidance documents. Um, we also urge folks that, you know, as you're working on things, you know, President Biden's goal is to get the lead out. So, you know, once you have a sense, if you want to start working on those replacements, you can feel free to do that. We're, we're always going to be trying to work towards a more proactive, um, proactive stance now with the LCRR. Um, and then the last thing I, I mentioned is just that if, you, if you're a system who is already walking down that corrosion control pathway, either due to an action level exceedance um, maybe source corrosivity identified by plan and technical review, um, or maybe simultaneous compliance issues, 
then your system should keep moving towards that path um, and keep working towards what we call optimization, um, just so that you, know, you can increase your chances of being compliant with the LCRR when that compliance date comes. Okay, so here's some additional resources. Um, these are a lot of EPA's links. That bottom link was for the first guidance document that EPA put out, uh, the guidance for developing and maintaining a service line inventory. And like I said, they've also since come out with two additional guidances just at the end of June. You can use that top EPA website link to get to those. Um, but they're, they're a great source, and they've got some really great graphics if you're a, a visual person. I, I certainly am, so I, I like the graphics. Okay. And then lastly, I want to talk about some of the resources that are available on our TCEQ Lead and Copper webpage. Actually, this is our new LCRR webpage. Um, and you can, it's where you can find the inventory template form 20943 and a bunch of other helpful resources that we've been working on. So one of the resources that we've developed is an instructional YouTube video. It's broken down into chapters. You can skip to the, just the section you want additional information on, but it walks you through this inventory template um, in a lot more detail than what I just did here today. Another resource is a template SOP. So EPA advises that systems that are working on verifying unknown service lines, that they should document that process in a standard operating procedure. And so we developed an SOP template to help systems do that. Um, so like a, like a fun Mad Lib, you can take our template and fill it out with the information that suits your system and have that on file um, for the future. So one of the key features of this template though is that it contains two appendices that operators can take um, and use in the field for documenting some of the things in the inventory. If anyone has ever tried to print out our Excel template, you'll know that that is a nightmare. So this is a much easier printable uh, template to use if you wanna document things in the field. Don't try to print out the Excel workbook. Use, use this, uh, the appendices in our SOP template. And then finally, the LCRR webpage also includes a frequently asked questions section. So um, if you have questions, you're not alone. Everyone should have questions. So, but the chances are that maybe someone else has already asked your question. And check out this FAQ section um, just to see some of the, the answers to questions we've already answered. Um, finally, just here's my contact information along with the email addresses for the lead and copper monitoring team. Um, we actually have a new email specifically for questions related to the LCRR, and that is just simply lcrr at tcq.texas.gov. And with that, I think we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, we have some microphones, so wait for a microphone to get to you before you ask your questions so that we can make sure everybody hears. Oh, and I think this gentleman up front is gonna be our first. Is the microphone on? There we go. Okay. There you go. Trey, DRWA, how are you doing, Laura? Hi, We've calmed before. <clears throat> There's some confusing language that's got some board members confused. Now I only know one system this applies to that has no lead. Their system was built after 1994. Uh -huh. And it's in the EPA guidance document for lead service line inventories, page 80 through 82, that specifically deals with the public accessibility document. Okay. And the language is, is if you have no lead, then you can sign a statement, so on and so forth. But that is for public notification. They still must do the lead service line inventory. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. So, um, yeah, in speaking to EPA, you know, when we were drafting this inventory template in the beginning, we sim very, very similarly had thought that maybe we could use a certification statement for folks who were reporting only non-lead. But in talking to EPA, that was, that was not their opinion, um, that a certification statement is not an inventory. And the rule asks that all water systems submit an inventory for their initial. So you're correct, yeah, the public notice, and, and for future you can use that certification statement, but everyone is required to submit an initial inventory. Excellent question. Okay. So we've got five minutes left, so maybe we One get, more question right yeah. over here. I'll also be sticking around just after this presentation, just in the transition between the next presentation if anyone has additional questions, but we also have 
um, a workshop later on this afternoon discussing the inventory, so feel free to come to that as well with, with any additional questions. Yes, sir. Okay, you mentioned earlier apartments, yes. uh, how this pertains to them. I have seven RV parks and I've got one tiny home community. How is this, how does this affect those? Do, do I count each and every home or do I have count it to all together or what's the question? Yeah, so it could, it could depend, but yeah, if it's branching, if the service line branches from building to building, then each segment between each building would need to be included. And that's where those, those fact sheets and that uh, guidance for small entities has, has all those scenarios outlined to show exactly those kinds of scenarios. Are you discouraging people from digging the meter boxes up and the lines? Yes, so the, as we said, the LCRR requires record review. So we want folks to work from a point of least invasive to most invasive. Least invasive is record review. And you know, certainly we've had plenty of people come up with concerns about stepping foot on customer property, you know, what gives me the right, et cetera. And so, you know, out of everyone's, for everyone's benefit, yeah, I would say the excavation should be a, a last, your last choice. Use all these other tools to your advantage if you can. Um, there's, you know, even just a visual inspection in the meter box is, is much preferred than actually going to dig, at least at this time. Okay, I just wanna remind you that we do have a lead service line workshop this afternoon at 3.30 in the San Antonio room, and they're gonna be going over completing that lead service line inventory. Thank you, and thank you, Laura.